So my thanks as always to Wyatt and Cherie and the staff and to the poets Danny Anderson and I have been meeting with and will meet th with this afternoon. It's the best group I've had the luck to encounter here in 20 years. My apologies to the basketball players. I hope you're not here. The lectures have been so good. After each of them, I've taken this lecture out and fretted over it. And for now, though, fretting has to stop until after tomorrow's lectures. The title of this talk is American Devotions. Uh, but you'll see I have to begin with some of the English variety. The handout contains the longer passages and entire poems I'll be quoting from. Devotional poetry, I'm sure we would all agree, belongs to the first half of the 17th century, at least in the English tradition, and reached whatever excellence it achieved in the sacred poems of John Donne and George Herbert. John Donne's holy sonnets and George Herbert's poems from the temple took religious matters having to do solely with Christian belief as a public but primarily a personal concern. The personal emphasis in both poets is crucial. Devotional worship, though it may be corporate or communal in practice, also has the connotation of being a private approach to God by one who is devout. In the devotional poem, this approach occurs as a direct or indirect address. John Donne addresses God directly in the 17th of his holy sonnets when he considers the loss of his wife who died in childbirth and strives to put her loss in the context of orthodox belief. Since she whom I love hath paid her last debt to nature and to hers, and my good is dead, and her soul early into heaven ravished, wholly on heavenly things my mind is set. Here the admiring her, my mind did wet to seek thee, Lord, so streams do show the head. But though I have found thee, and though my thirst hast fed, a holy thirsty dropsy melts me yet. But why should I beg more love, when as thou dost woo my soul for hers offering all thine? And dost not only fear lest I allow my love to saints and angels things divine, but in thy tender jealousy dost doubt, lest the world flesh, yea, devil, put thee out. I think we can recognize the grief-stricken anxiety of the poem, even as we may be uncomfortable with the paradoxical resolution. Dunn acknowledges God's jealous insistence that the love he offers to the bereft poet should be sufficient, and admits that this jealousy is tender and based on a divine doubt that the grieving widower can resist temptation. Still, the last six lines are inflected with a question, but why should I? Which subtly suggests a lack of acceptance on Dunn's part. Herbert can also sound like one of our contemporaries, and that is, that's partly my point here, by the indirection of his address. In the following poem, a sonnet like Dunn's, we are never sure whether Herbert is addressing prayer itself, though we can be sure that there is no final independent clause to resolve the argument. Prayer, the church's banquet, angel's age, God's breath in man returning to his birth, the soul in paraphrase, heart in pilgrimage, the Christian plummet sounding heaven and earth, engine against the almighty, sinner's tower, reversed thunder, Christ's side piercing spear, the six days world transposing in an hour, a kind of tomb which all things hear and fear softness and peace and joy and love and bliss, exalted manna, gladness of the best, heaven in ordinary, man well-dressed, the milky way, the bird of paradise, church bells beyond the stars heard, the soul's blood, the land of spices, something understood. The house where we're staying has several copies of the Sewanee Theological Review, which I've been looking at. 
and I found Stephen Campus' excellent essay on Anthony Hecht and George Herbert in one uh, called Gladness of the Best. So I read it and I thought, let me see what I, he knows. <laughs> he knows a lot. Dunn's poem sets a model of urgency for the contemporary devotional poem, but Herbert's is a model of ambiguity and indirection. Yet there's no doubt that these are the kinds of poems we associate with devotional poetry. Dunn's and Herbert's gifts as poets and intellects made the form of the devotion one of the arts of poetry. Though the devotion may be practiced by anyone of faith, the art of the poet, especially a genius like Dunn or Herbert, raises that practice to a level not accessible to all. It may be for this reason that Samuel Johnson's cast doubt on the writing of poems as prayers, since he believed rightly that the inventiveness of poetry undermines the sincerity of prayer. For prayer at its most personal and private, he argued, may be inarticulate. T.S. Eliot put his oar in in his 1935 essay, Religion and Literature, by arguing that, at least from the modern point of view, devotional poetry, as a form, was destined for minor status. He actually assigns that rank to George Herbert in the same essay, mm -hmm. amending an earlier comment that he thought, perhaps he's major. No, I've decided he's minor. <laughs> You look back at it and you think, you're wrong. <laughs> Eliot might have dismissed John Donne as well if Donne had written only his religious poetry. Still, Eliot argues that the range of human interest in the devotional poem is narrow. And we know that Donne's range in that regard was greater than Herbert's. But wherever you come down on this argument, which I know may sound historically esoteric, Still, for the devotional poem in English, the benchmark has been set by Herbert and Dunn. And after them, there's very little we can point to for the next three centuries, except Blake's Songs of Innocence and Songs of Experience and the great 18th century hymns. Blake's poems are more like catechisms, though, or Sunday school lessons than personal devotions, and the hymns are meant for group singing, corporate worship, and not necessarily for private meditation. But there was also in the late 19th century the extraordinary poetry of Gerard Manley Hopkins, devotional in the sense I want to argue, but known in its time mainly to Robert Bridges, himself a poet and a writer, among other things, of Anglican hymns. Still, if we have any interest in devotional poetry, it's Hopkins. We probably associate with the genre along with Herbert and Dunn. I wanted to find an example of Hopkins' poetry, which, like Dunn's and Herbert's, would give a sense of what a contemporary devotional poem might sound like or be concerned with. So I thought I had found a lesser known poem by Hopkins uh, to read to you in which, he had, in which it is not clear whether he is directly addressing himself or his soul and therefore indirectly addressing God. And then last week on July 28th, lo and behold, Garrison Keillor is reading this very poem <laughs> on the writer's almanac and actually doing a very good job with a difficult poem to read. So the, uh, the word is out. My own heart let me have more pity on. Let me live in my, to my sad self hereafter kind, charitable. Not live this tormented mind with this tormented mind tormenting yet. I cast for comfort I can no more get by groping round my comfortless than blind eyes in their dark can day or thirst can find thirsts all in all in all a world of wet. Soul, self. Come poor Jack self, I do advise you, jaded, let be. Call off thoughts a while elsewhere, leave comfort root room. Let joy sighs at God knows when to God knows what whose smile's not wrung, see you? Unforeseen times, rather, as skies between pine mountains lights a lovely mile. As in the poems by Dunn and Herbert, we get a strong sense of the interior conversation or monologue, that interiority that Charles Martin talked about in his lecture. It's certainly an important feature of the poems I'm going to be talking about. I'm also going to be talking about the address or apostrophe 
as an aspect of the devotional poem at any time, even when ambiguous. Nevertheless, that the devotional poem is associated with another time, and that, or that it is in its limitations necessarily minor, doesn't seem to matter to those who have written devotional poetry, or what I'm calling devotional poetry, in the last 40 years. And I think that is because the possibilities of its subject have extended beyond conventional religious faith, and in American poetry anyway, discovered in the best modern sense a tradition different from that of Duns and Herberts. And that new form of devotional poetry is what I am talking about today. But I have to begin with the most recent revival of the devotional poem as a practice of Christian worship in American poetry. When John Berryman's 11 Addresses to the Lord appeared in his book Love and Fame in 1970, it was an effort not only to write a devotional poem, but to reawaken the form and make it new. Robert Lowell called Berryman's poem one of the great poems of the age, a puzzle and a triumph to anyone who wants to write a personal devotional poem. He also noted the poem's cunning skepticism. I think the skepticism which Lowell noted in his friend's poem is an essential element of any effective religious poem at any time. But in our time, it has to be foremost and not simply present in that necessary element of any metaphor, irony. 11 Addresses to the Lord is replete with frank statements of skepticism. The last two quatrains of the first address are a good example. I have no idea whether we live again. It doesn't seem likely from either the scientific or the philosophical point of view, but certainly all things are possible to you. And I believe as fixedly in the resurrection appearances to Peter and to Paul as I believe I sit in this blue chair. Only that may have been a special case to establish their initiatory faith. Berman's skepticism is offered, retracted, and offered again with qualifications but without it, the poem would be merely pious and not personal at all, and certainly not a poem that anyone would care to read. It would, almost, it would most likely be, as Eliot noted in the essay I mentioned before, propaganda. Though it is impossible not to consider the religious import of Berryman's poem and its significance as he attempts to return to the Roman Catholicism of his youth that bright candle of faith blown out by his father's suicide when he was 12. I want to think about the poem in another way, especially as a kind of contemporary poem of address that, with some others I'm going to consider, may serve as a way to write effective devotional poetry outside the boundaries of religious orthodoxy. In fact, outside the boundaries of religion altogether, a secular devotional poetry or let's say a quasi-secular devotional poetry. I will admit here that the very term devotional suggests some devout attitude toward an object like God, worthy of reverence and requiring a mode of address which recognizes its transcendent power and ultimate meaning. The Berryman's poem is, to quote Lowell again, an example of a personal devotional poem, suggests that there's a kind of devotional poem which is not personal. Yet when I look back at the two great English examples of the devotional poem I gave earlier, Herbert and Dunn, they seem personal enough, especially Dunn's holy sonnets with their urgent sense of apology and justification. Herbert and Dunn are also working out in their poems, though, orthodox theological arguments, adapting their own desires and anxieties to them. By personal, I think Lowell means, and Berryman would agree, that though the poems address God, the God they imagine addressing is not one wholly defined by religious dogma. Berryman addresses a God of rescue, as he calls him in a later poem. You have come to my rescue again and again in my impassable, sometimes despairing years. You have allowed my brilliant friends to destroy themselves, and I am still here, severely damaged but functioning. This passage alone would make, should make us acknowledge a sense of the personal, and that person is not as anxious as Herbert and Dunn, or even Hopkins, to justify himself within some received form. The twisted, even devious syntax Berryman had perfected by the time he wrote the addresses 
allows him in the next one to set himself apart from his fellow Christians and assert a personal belief. I say thy kingdom come. It means nothing to me. Has thou prepared astonishments for man? One sudden coming? Many so believe. So not, without knowing anything, do I. That's very cunning. In fact, Berryman's address is universalist in its acknowledgement of God's ubiquity and multiplicity. Addressing God as caretaker who haunt the avenues of Angkor Wat, recalling all that prayer, that glory dispersed. He asks God to haunt me at the corner of Fifth and Hennepin, then adds three more epithets, shield and fresh fountain, manifester, even mine. The epithet or metaphorical name is the principal figure of speech in Berryman's poem. As soon as he brings God into the contemporary moment, he draws names again from the lexicon of the Bible. Still, he wants to see God in a way that is both fresh, yet part of a literary tradition. I fell back in love with you, Father, for two reasons. You were good to me, and a delicious author rational and passionate. Then he adds, Father Hopkins said the only true literary critic is Christ. That great unorthodox writer of sacred verses, William Blake, would have agreed. And our poet himself declares, let me lie down exhausted, content with that. Why did Lowell also regard the poem as a puzzle? That's more difficult to determine. Berryman in the book in which it appeared, Love and Fame, departed from his famous dream song persona, Henry, yet insisted that the poems of the book's title section, detailing his love life and literary celebrity and problems with alcohol and mental illness, were not autobiographical. He wrote, I am not writing an autobiography in verse, my friends. Did he mean that disclaimer to apply to 11 addresses to the Lord as well? That's puzzling. The addresses follow this series of often boasting and gossipy revelations. And there are times when the boasting can still be heard in them, especially in the poet's claims of wretchedness and amazing grace. Now, you can hear this kind of boasting in Dunn as well. I am the most miserable sinner. <laughs> and uh, just forget that I exist, he says at one point to God. So there's a tradition of this um, sin of pride entering in. Confusions and afflictions followed my days. Wives left me. Bankrupt, I closed my doors. You pierced the roof twice and again. Finally, you opened my eyes. Now, brooding through a history of the early church, I identify with everybody, even the heresiarchs. And at times, the poem reads like the poet's own 12-step program, minus one. But Lowell saw it, and I'm trying to see it as a model for anyone wanting to write a personal devotional poem. How can a puzzle be a model? And finally, we know the poem did not rescue John Berryman from suicide, nor did the God of rescue, which it addresses. Twice, Berryman refers to widows in the addresses, once to his own. He says, strengthen my widow. In the final section, the poet imagines his end, contrasting it to the ends of early Christian martyrs and speaks with some degree of modesty while reminding us not for the first time of his career as a distinguished academic. Make to me acceptable at the end of time in my degree, which then thou wilt award. Cancer, senility, mania, I pray I may be ready with my witness. Eleven addresses to the Lord, like all devotional poems, is a poem of reverence, but, it is, but if it is to succeed, it has to persuade us that the object of reverence has a living substance, even if that substance is of the imagination alone. I hope it goes without saying that we also have to be persuaded that that object is worthy of reverence. The God Berryman addresses is a personal God, and that deity's interest and care for individual human lives is assumed by faith, the substance of things unseen, and has been assumed for at least 4,000 years. That is. Berryman didn't just make this God up for the sake of his poem, though some of the theological dimensions seem fairly original with the poet. Though Berryman's God is the craftsman of the snowflake and sole watchman of the flying stars, still his God is addressed and imagined in fairly abstract terms 
a prayer for the self and lift up sober toward truth, a scared self-estimate. And in section nine, the poet quotes an old theologian who has stated that even to say you exist is misleading. Finally, the poet asks this incomprehensible God to bear in mind me. Now we're moving on. In contrast, the deity Morris Manning's bucolics address is entirely concrete and in every way the God personified in nature, present in a poem like Keats's to Autumn and identified by James Merrill in the changing light at Sandover as the God the biology. The strength of Manning's series, which he published in 2007, is that as ever present, as imminent as the God Manning addresses as boss may be, there's a sense of uncertainty that boss cares about the poet in a personal way. Much can be assumed about boss's oversight and involvement in creation except that. Insofar as the speaker speaks in, fits in with natural cycles, then he enjoys the fruits of providence. The title of the series, Bucolics, takes us back to the classical pre-Christian world, that world that Wordsworth expresses such nostalgia for in his famous sonnet, The World is Too Much With Us. Manning's boss is associated entirely with rural and agrarian matters, and the speaker in the poem sounds at times like an industrious and curious farmer. I'm going to assume, though, that the speaker is the poet and not a persona like Wendell Berry's Mad Farmer. He may simply be someone who lives in the country. An urban dweller might define boss in another way entirely. Boss of the grassy green, boss of the silver puddle, how happy is my lot to tend the green, to catch the water when it rains, to do the doing, boss. I think this selection of a name for if this is God is, is pretty inspired because of its, its American connotations. Uh, the root meaning of the word boss seems to come from a Dutch term for a ship's captain. And the writer of the particular entry I read speculates that its American usage implies more of an egalitarian sense, not present in, say, master. Uh, but we all, I mean, if you've ever done farm work, you know what a straw boss is, and um, that there's nothing egalitarian about your relationship <laughs> to them. The title Bucolics recalls Virgil. The speaker often sounds like the psalmist David, yet unlike the psalmist, the poet seems to have an ongoing beef with his relationship to boss. It doesn't matter how I feel about it. What I want from you is nothing, boss, compared to what you want from me. You want it all to always go your way. And reminding us that this relationship is like that of a hired man to his boss, he admits, I guess you've got a lot of hands, though I'm just one of many, boss. And though he can imagine boss as the blackbird laughing at him from a tree, as he reaches to pick a pawpaw or the tree frog on the trunk looking at him upside down, he also claims to imagine an anthropomorphic figure. I believe your baby face, boss, a face as smooth as an onion, which nicely implies that like an onion, boss's identity is layered and may have nothing at heart. At times the poems can sound petulant, childish, deliberately simple-minded, but never for long. That bare branch, that branch made black by the rain, the silver raindrop hanging from the black branch. Boss, I like that black branch. I like that shiny raindrop, boss. Tell me if I'm wrong, but it, it makes me think you're looking right at me now. Isn't it a lark for me to think you look that way, upside down like a tree frog? Boss, I'm not surprised at all. I wouldn't doubt it for a minute. You're always up to something. I'll say one thing. You're all right. All right you are, even when you're hanging, boss. The turn from the accidental to the intentional occurs so often that it appears to be the argument or aim of each of the 78 poems in Bucolics. And I, I said this without explaining that at the end of that passage, even when you're hanging boss, I mean, I think of the boss who is hanging from a very important tree in Christian faith. And yet though boss seems to be regarding him from every facet of the natural world, he won't speak to the poet or give him a sign he doesn't have to guess at. You know, I never know for sure. I only know you bother me from time to time. You've caught my breath. When it comes to language, he admits your other favorite word is not a word at all. You get so hushed up, boss. My ears get lonely. I wish you'd let me hear from you. 
this is a complaint of all believers. And like all the poems, the range of the complaint runs from the simplest request to the most sophisticated. The second to last poem begins, am I your helper boss or am I not? Do I bring in the hay for me or you or only for the horse? And the last poem ends, oh, tell me why I can't hold back this bitter thought. Are you the bee or just the stinging story boss? And there we are with the modern dilemma of religious belief. It may be beautiful and profound that we cannot tell the dancer from the dance. But if we cannot tell the creator from the creation, then the creator's role is compromised, if not irrelevant. We cannot write the personal devotional poem except to a God we have to imagine into existence. Theologically, however, Bucolics has more in common with 11 addresses to the Lord than either has with the next poem. But as a reverential address, Jean Valentine's Lucy is as much a devotional poem as Manning's or Berryman's. Valentine's poem, a sequence from her 2010 book, Break the Glass, is addressed to the fossil skeleton discovered in Ethiopia in 1974 of a southern ape of afar, or Australopithecus afarensis, a female believed at the time to be the oldest hominid ancestor of the human family. An epigraph to the sequence reminds us that in Ethiopia, people refer to her with a term that means you are beautiful or you are amazing. There are elements in the poem which suggest ancestor worship, and the poet clearly invites this reading. But as a devotional poem, Lucy brings much more to bear than that simple response. For the poet, Lucy is not only a prime example of the feminine, but possibly of the poet. Jean Valentine's passionate address to this remarkable collection of fossilized human bones offers all sorts of interesting ways into the poem and to the sense of personal devotion. After the historical note about Lucy's identity, her name was given her by her discoverers who determined that despite her small brain, she must have walked upright and must have been female. And you probably know more th about this story that they had determined that this was what they thought it was and they were listening to the Beatles. <laughs> you see in this guy with diamonds, he has to call her Lucy. But you know, there's so many other things with the, associated with the name. Valentine provides an introductory poem or dedication or address. Lucy, your secret book that you leaned over and wrote just in the dirt, not having to have an ending, not having to last. It becomes clear that for the poet, Lucy is not only an ancestral mother, but also possibly some kind of writer herself, one without any obligation to art and posterity, but the making of art. She may be the embodiment of poetry itself. The power with which Lucy is endowed by Valentine's imagination has been passed on or passed back to the poet. The dedicatory poem is followed by a quotation from Psalm 139, verse 16, in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. This emphasizes Lucy's role as a forebear, until we dwell on the notion that the worshippers' members were written. But because of the Psalm 39 is addressed to the Lord, as an epigraph, the passage reminds us of Lucy's relationship to the poet. She is to the poet Jean Valentine, what the Lord is to the psalmist. It is partly this relationship which makes Lucy a devotional poem, as I'm defining it. As such, Lucy takes on several roles of veneration. She is a blessed mother. I rush outdoors into the air you are, Lucy, and you rush out to receive me. At last, there you are, who I always knew was there, but almost died not meeting. When my scraped out child died, Lucy, you hold her all the time. She's also a classical psychopomp, a guide of souls to the realm of the dead. Lucy, when Jane in her last clothes goes across with Chekhov, you are the ferryman. Lucy is like the angel in Jacob's wrestling match. Still all night long, my Lucy, I entreat you. I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And finally, she is that blending of act and intention which is possible only in the presence of the muse. How did you pray, Lucy? You were prayer, your hands and toes. When writing came back to me, I prayed with lipstick on the windshield as I drove. 
Newton made up with the world. He had already turned himself into gold. He was already there. Skeleton woman, in, down, over, around. I would like to say that Lucy is the poet's muse, finally, but I, I think she represents something more, or perhaps it is simply another way of thinking of the muse. Lucy is the poet's connection with the very creation out of which she makes poetry. Lucy, my sassafras that splits the rocks, wild good mother, you fill my center hole with bliss. No one is so tender in her scream, wants me so much. Not just, but brings me to be, is when I am close to death and close to life. Lucy is both the rock-breaking flower of the William Carlos Williams poem to which Valentine alludes in this passage. But she is also, a, as a fossil relic, the rock itself. For this flower, Valentine has stated clearly, I gave all I had to the poor. And on this rock, she has built her poem. The Lord God boss Lucy. They are real presences, living substances, for which these poets have written poems of devotion. And yet, this is surely not the whole story. For if the devotional poem is going to endure, as I believe it has endured, then it must address the absence, the non-being, which for over a century now, poetry has recognized it must fill. Even Berryman's Christian God is a novel imagining of God, as are Manning's boss, Valentine's Lucy. They are substances of the imagination, which the poet insists or hopes will respond. But the problem for devotional poetry is to make absence the fact of non-existence worthy of address, of the reverence which these poets have shown their objects of reverence. I can refer to any number of great modern poems which acknowledge the ultimate power of non-being. But I want to speak now of devotional poems which treat it as if it, too, were a living substance. The long poem, Letters for the Dead, at the heart of Philip Levine's 1933, which he published in 1973, is a sequence in 10 parts, which purports to be what the title implies, written news posted to those departed, in particular to the poet's father, whose death in 1933, when the poet was five, gives the book's title its significance. The fourth stanza of the first part speaks of trying to say something to each of you of what it is without you. So the particularity of the father's death becomes generalized and multiplied. What follows is a world so replete with absences, so completely divorced from any sense of a transcendent being, any divinity to address, even a deceased parent, that it may seem paradoxical to call the poem devotional. But scene after scene, life after life, as it is depicted, works iconically, as if each could be held up to the absent God to demonstrate what it is without you. Levine is famous for turning negations into affirmations, and that characteristic of his poetic style is no less present here. Since you are absent, the poem implies, your briefcase bulged with rusting tools, your shoes aged, the toes curling upward in a spasm, your voice, your high voice of pear and honey shuddered once along the bare walls. But someone ate the pear, someone ate the honey, we still ate at the usual hours, and went off to the factories in the dark with bloodless sandwiches folded in wax paper with tiny packages of sweets. No one felt your sleep arriving or heard the sudden intakes of fear. No one held your hands to keep them still or your face glowing like a clock's. In the poem, things spill their tears as they age, but the remembered voice has been consumed by death and the living go on surviving in a familiar Levine landscape of exhausting factory work. There's also the alternative to this landscape, a typical of Levine as well, that of Spain with its pastoral life, set against an even more tragic history than Detroit's. Yet even in Spain, the absence which Levine addresses, which informs his devotions, takes shape as a series of negations. The sea calmed, the village darkened toward dawn, I was there, Awake in a strange room, my children breathing slowly in the warm air. Down the hall, the workers bunched together, three to a bed grunting in sleep. Beside me, my wife, in still another world. On the roof, not a single light. The sea reflecting nothing, one black wave untipped with spray, 
slipping towards shore to spread like oil, and then no more. Nothing moved, no wind, no voice, no sound of anything, not one drop riding down my face to scald the earth. In a devotional poem, including those I have talked about so far, the poet is anxious to know his or her proper relationship to the one addressed, that Lord in power, and to know what that Lord in power might expect to require. It is as if the Lord or Boss or Lucy had set a series of spiritual tasks which the poet had to figure out and perform, one of which, of course, is to write the poem. This is not apparently the case with Levine. The task he has set himself is to say, what it is without you. I will interpret that to mean, though, how we live life without you, write poetry, love our families, anticipate death without you, that you being not only the poet's father, but God. The poem tells what these aspects of living are like. They can be exalted in their commonplace pleasure, nightmarish both awake and asleep, and mysterious in their consolation. I told my wife while I was working on that, every time I read these passages from Levine, I feel like I'm channeling his voice. <laughs> it's a little uncomfortable, but it's I'm sure he, if he were here, he said, that doesn't sound like me at all, <laughs> which would be his way of saying it does. Anyway. <laughs> I ate an apple, the skin, the sour white meat, the core, how I relished the juice, praise the apple. I struck my strange tall son again and again until my wife came begging from our bed and pulled me away. For 40 days, I dreamed my death like yours, at great speed, the bones shattering into meat, blood blurring the world, the spirit issuing outward in a last breath. And came to land, weak and alive, the sunlight crossed my bed, I rose and fed the cat, the green worms fattened on the vine. I looked in the corners of things. Ultimately, the dead are informed that their power dissipates as they are forgotten. Your books on the shelf give up their words one by one. Your wedding band, with its secret calligraphy of where sleeps in a coffee can. Warm days, the child you never saw weeds the rhubarb. White grains collect above his lips and flake away in the sudden wind. Neither Berryman's Lord nor Manning's boss, nor Valentine's Lucy is as circumscribed by time as Levine's dead are, because none of them need to be remembered. Even Valentine's Lucy, as part of the fossil record, transcends time. But the non-being of the dead has its paradoxical existence only as long as the living who remember them. It is this information, useless really, which the letters of the poem convey. And so at the end of the poem, Levine steps away from the mode of address, which keeps the poem personal in its anti-devotion, and steps back into the detached third person, stating in the last line, even the dead are growing old. Levine's devotional poem is, in a sense, an anti-devotion, bleak and bitter for the most part, and only indirectly acknowledges the power which precludes transcendence. That power is time. Berryman's God, his Redeemer Christ, is unbounded by time and transcends it, which allows for him to be present in the poet's life and to come to his rescue, albeit mysteriously. Levine believes in no such God, and yet letters for the dead, as it shares the news of what it is without you, implies that the one enduring presence in the world of absences is time. Time circumscribes existence. There's nowhere beyond it. The tone of anger running through Levine's poem, I believe, has to do with the recognition of this fact. And though I risk inferring too much psychologically about the origin of Levine's poem and his poetry generally, such an anger has to do with the loss of some former faith, like the loss of Levine's father. Berryman Alt, too, speaks of the loss of his faith and his father's suicide, but 11 Addresses to the Lord has to do with his recovery of faith, now with a more adult dimension. Devotional poetry, then, not only expresses faith in something, whether it is God or time, but it gives us a sense that the poet is attempting to reconcile him or herself to the, I want to say, power of that thing, but I can see all kinds of ways I might be misinterpreted. So instead, I'm going to say, the poet is attempting to reconcile him or herself to the necessary reality of that thing, 
by establishing a personal, even private, relationship with it. This is better demonstrated with examples, which in poetry never entirely conform to an abstract definition. The poet who has created over many years a devotional style in the vein I am trying to describe and who also recognizes the time is Lord of the Universe and of our lives is Charles Wright. His most recent book, Sestets, offers us a form, a six-line poem based implicitly on the part of the sonnet after the turn that reflects the circumscription of time. After the octave or first eight lines of the sonnet, when the sestet begins, we can feel the end coming. His attitude toward this inevitability, unlike Levine's, is, as he says in the poem, future tense, bittersweet. All things in the end are bittersweet. An empty gaze, a little waste station just beyond silence. If you can't delight in the everyday, you have no future here. And if you can, no future either. And time, black dog, will sniff you out and lick your lean cheeks and lie down beside you, warm, real close, and will not move. This is not to say that Wright issues any sense that time might be transcended and a connection with the transcendent reality achieved. His poetry has become capacious enough to allow for the feeling, if not the fact, to be embodied. The titles of these sestets often read like first lines. The evening is tranquil and dawn is a thousand miles away. The mares go down for their evening feed into the meadow grass. Two pine trees sway the invisible wind. Some sway, some don't sway. The heart of the world lies open, leached and ticking with sunlight for just a minute or so. The mares have their heads on the ground. The trees have their heads on the blue sky. Two ravens circle and twist. On the borders of heaven, the river flows clear a bit longer. The very first poem in Sestets lets us know where we are going in an existence determined by and circumscribed by time, tomorrow. The metaphysics of the quotidian was what he was after, a little dew on the sunrise grass, a drop of blood in the evening trees, a drop of fire. If you don't shine, you are darkness. The future is merciless. Everyone's name is inscribed on the flyleaf of the Book of Snow. In describing the poems by Berryman, Manning, Valentine, and even Levine, I have said that an element of their devotional nature is that they address objects worthy of devotion. It is clear that many of Wright's sestets are kind of talking to himself, like most modern lyric poems. But tomorrow also suggests in the turn from third person to second person that he is speaking to the reader. And that implies another sort of faith, faith that a reader exists. Here's the greatest expression I know of that faith, the last section of Song of Myself. The spotted hawk swoops by and accuses me. He complains of my gab and my loitering. I, too, am not a bit tamed. I, too, am untranslatable. I sound my barbaric yap over the roofs of the world. The last scud of day holds back for me. It flings my likeness over the rest and true as any on the shadowed wilds. It coaxes me to the vapor and the dust. I depart as air. I shake my white locks at the runaway sun. I effuse my flesh in eddies and drifted in lacy jags. I bequeath myself to the dirt to grow from the grass I love. If you want me again, look for me under your boot soles. You will hardly know who I am or what I mean, but I shall be good help to you nevertheless and filter and fiber your blood. Failing to fetch me at first, keep encouraged. Missing me one place, search another. I stop somewhere waiting for you. Of course, we all know that Walt is celebrating himself, that container of multitudes who finds it as lucky to die as to be alive. But if devotional poems are, as part of their nature, have to express faith in something, faith is, after all, again, the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. In this case, you and me, readers. Whitman's faith, in this greatest of American devotional poems, that to me is the riskiest thing I've said, I'm willing to. <laughs> greatest of American devotional poems is that there will be a reader who will find him. I think he shares this faith with all poets, even those who profess to have no faith at all. I've made many assumptions in trying to extend the definition of devotional poetry beyond a religious tradition, and these assumptions 
are based obviously on my own Christianity and the way it has informed my thinking. But I have also been guided for years by a late poem by Emily Dickinson. Those dying then knew where they went. They went to God's right hand. That hand is amputated now and God cannot be found. The abdication of belief makes the behavior small. Better an ignis fatuous than no loom at all. That will-o'-the-wisp or foolish fire, the ignis fatuous is a powerful guide. As Emily Dickinson modestly suggests, since it must make for a larger behavior than not believing at all. The devotional poem in any form is the opposite of an abdication of belief. It is an affirmation. It may appear that in this lecture on craft, since I have emphasized the thematic dimension of craft, I have used the term form loosely, especially since the poems I have referred to vary in their formal construction, though even Berryman's depart from the recognizable English verse tradition, which underlies much of what we call formal poetry today. So let me quote a higher authority. By formal, we are not to mean the meter only, but also, and it is probably even more important, the literary type with its fictitious point of view from which the poet approaches his object and its prescription of style and tone. And by tradition, we should mean simply the source from which the form most easily comes. The tradition, excuse me, tradition is the handing down of a thing by society, and the thing handed down is just a formula or form. That is my man John Crow Ransom in The World's Body in 1938 in his essay, Forms and Citizens. The reason I have ended with Whitman and Dickinson, however, has to do with Ransom's first sense of what tradition is, the source from which the form most easily comes. Whether intentionally or not, the poets I have talked about here have discovered a tradition or source for their devotional poetry, which is different from George Herbert's and John Donne's, and all who attempt to address the God of Christianity in verse. But I would argue that even John Berryman among the five poets I have talked about, finds his source in Whitman and Dickinson. The tradition of the American devotional poem, radical in imagination, heterodox in belief, begins with them.